Let's face it, dinosaurs hold some of the most universally scary animals to have ever actually existed in Earth's history, with good reason. They've been carved into pop culture through media and the real life groups have given us some of the biggest and most awe-inspiring animals to have ever walked the Earth. But some groups get the spotlight over others, despite the under-discussed one holding some of the most terrifying land predators in history. Now I'm going to say a word and I will put money on the fact that one of two ideas are going to pop into your head when I say it. Raptors. Now whether it was a bird of prey or a movie monster, you probably thought of a dinosaur. Well, I mean, unless you're an American petrol-headed man's man and you thought of a pickup truck. But we'll go with the former. Either way, the connotations of the word lies mainly with two clades. But given the origins of the word and how much it has ended up encompassing, you might as well just say that that word refers to any predatory dinosaur. One group that we're looking at today has adopted this word, but he's neither a bird of prey or a dromaeosaur, instead being made up of pretty large theropods with claws that put big cats to shame. These are the Megaraptorans. Now the story of how these came to our attention is a little bit convoluted, hinted at by the name since it was originally thought that Dromaeosaurs got as big as Allosaurus. Two dinosaurs were initially discovered and described back in the 1990s, and the biggest standout features were the claws. Given how similar they looked, they were initially misidentified as the famous toe claws of the infamous Velociraptor relatives, showing members of the group that grew much bigger than we initially thought. These two were Fukui Raptor from Japan, and the group's namesake Megaraptor from South America. When inspected a little closer, however, these were soon found to have actually been hand claws, and by the mid to late 2000s, their placement was uncertain. It was then hypothesized that they were basal carcharodontosaurs, but many were arguing over this while placing other megaraptors that were being found in various families, from neovenatorids to even spinosaurs. With the various discoveries of new specimens, however, it was found in 2013 that these were all from the same family, and the megaraptorids were born. The overall shape of this group is somewhat reminiscent of a dromaeosaur, with long slender bodies and silurosaur legs that had a femur shorter than the tibia. Whilst no complete skull is known, various parts from certain species have been put together to give us a rough estimate. These were slender and lightly built, with long snouts that housed relatively small recurved teeth. Whilst small, these teeth did vary somewhat, with Megaraptor showing more Tyrannosaur-like teeth that were D-shaped in cross-section, members like Neurosraptor having much more Dromaeosaur-like teeth, being slightly fang-shaped and with little to no serrations, and basal members like Fukuiraptor showing very laterally compressed teeth similar to Carcharodontosaurs. Other features of the skull show how the initial confusion can be forgiven, with strongly developed sagittal crests like Tyrannosauroids, but also rather straight maxilla much like the Carcharodontosaurs. Moving a little further along, we see necks that were highly flexible, with vertebrae that were convex at the front and concave at the back for the next vertebrae to slot into. The torsos appear to have been relatively wide and the tail was deep and muscular, again akin to Tyrannosaurids. And then we get to those characteristic claws. These sported three clawed hands. However, the third finger was pretty small, whilst the first two were huge. In fact, Megaraptor itself shows the biggest extreme, with the first claw actually being longer than the entire forearm. In life, they would have been even bigger too, being covered in a keratinous sheath that would have made it longer, curvier, and more sharp. So why the huge claws then? Well, we will get into that, but first I want to give you an idea of how terrifying these things could be just by their size. Megaraptors obviously varied in size, but they were still pretty big animals. The smallest was one of the OGs, Bukiriraptor, coming in at around five meters or 16 feet long and between three to 400 kilograms or 660 to 880 pounds. Then we go all the way up to Maip, which measured at between 9 to 10 meters or 30 to 33 feet long and around 3 to 4 tons. There is another theropod that potentially increases the size range of this group, that being Bahariosaurus, which came in at between 11 to 12 meters or 36 to 40 feet in length and approximately 4.5 to 5 tons. However, it is currently being debated as to whether this is a Megaraptor or not. Now, considering that this has historically been a pretty enigmatic group, their actual evolutionary story has been a focal point. The leading theory is that these originated during the late Jurassic, 
but didn't reach widespread success until the early Cretaceous when they radiated out from Australia. The earliest Megaraptorid material, which has been nicknamed Lightning Claw, was found in the opal fields of Lightning Ridge, New South Wales, Australia, which is believed to showcase their ancestral home. At the time the southern continent of Gondwana was still present, meaning that Australia was still connected to Antarctica and in turn South America and Africa. They managed to spread across this southern supercontinent and really hit their stride in South America, where the environment here allowed them to reach much larger sizes, which they retained until their ultimate extinction thanks to the asteroid impacts at the end of the Cretaceous. And that kind of success is obviously down to something they're doing right. So how was this group actually living? Well, the slender body plan and long metatarsals show a group that were clearly built for running, living what is known as a cursorial lifestyle in much more wide open areas as pursuit predators. Exactly what they were chasing and how they chomped down on it when they caught it varied much more considerably, if we remember how much the teeth of these animals actually varied. Some would have been taking slicing bites, possibly wearing the animal down, others had a more robust bite, possibly so less went to waste and leaning more into scavenging. Either way, there was a clear misbalance between the small teeth and the massive claws. So no prizes for guessing what was their main weapon. The arm bones specifically were incredibly robust, with extraordinarily powerful pectoral and arm muscles. They weren't just powerful either, they were also highly mobile, at least for a theropod. These arms could reach out much further and flex back towards the body with tremendous strength, a strength that only increased as the group evolved across the Cretaceous. Stick some giant razor sharp claws on the end of those powerful arms and you've got an animal that would have been the last living thing you see if you were unlucky enough to receive a hug from it. Now I don't know about you but this is the last theropod group that I would want to be stuck in a room with. Now you could probably outrun a T-Rex and a lot of dromaeosaurs could arguably be dealt with if they keep those feet on the floor. But the Megaraptors? We're talking huge theropods that you can't outrun and have four razor sharp claws on very powerful arms ready to open you right up. No thanks. And let me know how much you agree by posting it down in the comments down below whilst I answer today's questions. The first of which comes from Gorilla Tag124, who's asked, Howdy from sunny Arizona. Uh, do Tyrannodons glide? Straight up jump and fly? I always have trouble imagining how their biomechanics work, especially on the big guys. Are there modern day analogues? Thank you, love your videos. Well, thank you for watching and enjoying them. Uh, yeah, so how the hell did these guys take off? Uh, now by Tyrannodons, I assume that you're just referring to pterosaurs overall um, just so I can cover Pteranodon along with the bigger and smaller guys just to cover how all these different mechanics will work. I have done a whole video on pterosaurs if you want to check it out but it goes without saying that the flight mechanics especially in takeoff would have differed a lot depending on size. The smaller ones wouldn't have had any issues or likely any differences much with birds but the larger ones are thought to have used a kind of quadrupedal jump to launch themselves into the air. They also could have stuck to high altitude places such as cliffs to simply fall from. When we get to the really big guys, such as Ajdarkids, it's thought that they didn't actually fly as much as you might think. They probably would have spent most of their time on the ground, performing tasks such as hunting and short distance travelling on all fours, while saving the flying for the big journeys, where they could use thermal wind currents to help those flight muscles keep them aloft. A few high effort flaps later, they could simply glide over those wind currents and only really exert those muscles in keeping balance and pitch. It should be noted though that these flight mechanics are poorly understood, with these leading theories possibly being subject to change as we find out more in the future. Uh, next one comes from the Velocicasper. Uh, what's your opinion on Nanosaurus and its size? I've seen estimates of 5 meters and a few hundred kilograms all the way up to 9 meters and several tons in weight. Considering how fragmentary the genus is, how reliable are these estimates in your opinion? Yeah, that is a difficult one. Whilst it's no real reliable way of coming up with exact size estimates, since there are a lot of variables, I think we should really take into account the ecosystem of the area when deciding which estimate is the closest. 
I spoke about this in my polar dinosaurs video, but in colder regions of the Mesozoic world such as the Arctic, where Nanoxaurus roamed, predators especially appeared to have hit a kind of Goldilocks size. Nanoxaurus would need to be big enough to take on the larger herbivores here, but an animal of 9 meters long and several tons would also need a lot of calories to need access to a much wider range of megafauna, which you don't really get as much of in colder climates. Considering that close relatives that live close by, both geographically and temporally, were on the larger end, I don't think that Nanoxaurus being 5 meters long is as likely, but I also can't see it having access to enough food to be on the larger end. So I personally feel that a middle ground length of around 7 meters or 23 feet and 1 to 2 tons is fairly sensible. Again though, that's just me going by arguably overly simplistic ecology just to shoot straight from the middle. Anyway, thank you so much for submitting the questions. I hope you enjoyed the answers. And if you have a question that you want me to answer, be sure to submit it in the community tab where I'm collecting all the questions. Other than that, I really hope you guys enjoyed this enough to come back again so I can catch you next time.